Amen. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 25. Last week we started the third, actually the third week of this series, Habits. We talked about the habit of growing, that, that we have to grow in our, in our own spiritual life. It's, it's, listen to me, it's not, it's not just the church's job to help you grow. It's not your spouse's job to help you grow. It's, it's not the seminary's job to help you grow. It's your responsibility and my responsibility that we are to get in God's word, that we are going to spend time with Jesus, that we're going to spend time in the local church, and we're going to do all the things that God has called us to do so that we can be a growing, thriving Christian. Is that okay? Amen. And then we talked the second week that, that God, not, as we grow, he tells us to go. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptize people, train people, make disciples. Our job is to grow and go. And then last week we dealt with Matthew 25 verses 1 through 13, and, and I was going to preach all, the, all three of these together, but as I got in my study, I felt like, hey, we need to break these things apart, so we're going to do this, this second one today. We're going to, last week, we dealt with the parable of the ten virgins. talks about having your heart ready, but I want to turn our attention to something called the, the next section called the parable of the talents, and it talks about that we are to have our talents, and, and you can fill this in, Matthew 25, verse 14 through, through 30, it's about having our talents and having our abilities ready for the service of the king. If, if I were to kind of um, give you the big picture this morning, this idea of parable of the talents, and, and I'm going to get into it, we're going to read here in just a second, is that we were put on this earth to work for Jesus. Can I just say that? We were put on this earth to work for Jesus. Let me say it another way. Let me say it the pastoral way. Let me say it the spiritual way here. We were saved to serve. We were saved to serve. Now, hear what I'm saying. We are saved to serve, not that we're saved because we serve. Are you with me this morning? That when you really have an encounter with Jesus, you're going to want to serve Him. And you're going to want to work for Him. Not work to get things from him, but work to add value and to add people to the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. We're going to read this. It says, For it is like a man about to go on a journey, and he called his own servants, and he entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent. And underline this phrase, depending on each one's ability. <clears throat> then he went on a journey. Immediately the man who had received five talents put them to work, and he got five more. The same way we see the man who had two earn two more. But the man who got one. So are you tracking? There's a man that got five. There's a man that had two. And then there's a man that was given one. The man that was given one went and dug a hole into the ground. And he held on to it. And he hid it. After a long time, verse 19, the master came of those servants. And he began to say, I want to settle accounts. The man who had received five approached, presented the five more talents. And he said, Master, you gave me five, so I've earned five more. And his master said to him, underline this, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll put you. This is kind of the watershed verse of this, me this morning's message. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Because you were faithful with the five and you earned five, I will put you in charge of more, said the master, share in the, his joy. The man with the two talents, the same thing we see. The master, you gave me two and I've earned two more. His master said, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. Hey, let, let me just stop here real quick because I know we have kids in here. Let me just, I, some of you parents are on edge this morning and, and I want to let you know it's okay. It's okay if your kid gets up. It's okay if your kid says hello. It's okay if they wave at me. It's totally okay. We love kids here. And, we, and that's why we have them here one Sunday a month in the sanctuary because a lot of churches say, oh, get rid of the kids. Hey, if we don't have kids, we don't have a church. Amen. So your kids are welcome here with their dirty diapers, with their snotty noses. Just wipe them off and take your tissues with you. Amen. But, but, but it's totally okay. So don't feel like you can't pay attention to what, what I'm presenting this morning because you got to keep your kids. It's okay. Now, we need to teach our kids how to act in church. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, though, to relax a little bit. Okay. You receive that? Okay. So, so the, the guy had five, got five more. The guy had two, got two more. He said, well done, that good and faithful servant. Then in verse 24, the man who received the one talent also approached and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man. 
Reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. Verse 25, so I was afraid and I went off and I hid your talent. So what you have is yours. Verse number 26, his master replied, you evil, lazy servant. You might want to highlight that one. We're going to talk about that. <clears throat> if you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money at the bankers. And I would have received at least a little bit of interest. So, take the ta- so he took the talent from him and he gave it to the one who had ten. So the first guy. For everyone who has more, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from that one who does not have, even from what he has will be taken away. I want you to hear this. And throw this good-for-nothing servant into the pit of outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to share four things with you this morning. The first thing is this. Notice I had you underline the first thing. Five talents and one, two talents and one talent. Verse 15 depending on each one's own ability. That's my first thing this morning, is that each servant was given talents based on their ability, not partiality. So this was a very strange idea in our culture, but in Bible culture it was not a very strange idea to to give servants or the slaves great responsibility. And and, and to give a servant in the Bible times um, some, some responsibility was one of the greatest and smartest things a man could do with his money. The best thing that a man could do, a man of wealth could do in his absence, was to divide it equally among the servants and leaving them to do the best that they could with it. And so we see in this text that he gives five talents to one, he gives two talents to another, he gives one talent to another. When I study this out, a talent was not just about abilities, But a talent was a unit of money worth at least $1,200 in modern terms. And likely much more. And the talent was not necessarily a coin, but it was a weight. And therefore, this particular talent was really dependent on, on whether the coinage was copper, gold, or silver. So one would weigh more than the other one. And so depending on what they were given, if they were given gold, uh, 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 silver, or, or copper, we would weigh it out. But we can surmise that probably at least $1,200 in modern uh, money today. Now, when you translate that to the Greek talent, or talenton, which is a sum of money, it was generally regarded, listen, and I know I'm giving you some math, as equal to 6,000 denarii. So when you, do, when you extrapolate all this math, listen to this. If a talent was equally worth more than 6,000 denarii, then it would take a day laborer 20 years to earn so much. So listen, the master came to the servant, and he gives at least the guy with the one talent at least 20 years worth of wages. Do the math for the other guys. Five talents, that's 100 years of wages, if my math is correct. The two talents, that's 40 years of wages. And he says, I want you to take this, and you're responsible for it. And it wasn't based on whether they were good investment bankers or not. They each got something. Because that's the goodness of God. And he says, each according to his own ability. Some received more, but everyone received something. I want to give you something real quick. One of the morals of this story is you will never be a good leader if you are a poor follower. Well, pastor, I I am called to lead. You might feel like you're called to lead But if God hasn't put the call to follow in your life, then God will never call you to lead anything. Are you with me this morning? And and God, listen to me, God gives us or will allow us to have that which He knows we can handle. You know why God hasn't given me a thousand member church? Because He said you can't handle a thousand member church. And honestly, it would scare me to death to have a thousand member church. Amen? God will give us what we can handle. Some want more. Some want this or that. But the reason they don't get it is because they don't manage what they have well. I want you to think of something. Some of you might say, well, if I just made 
another $50,000 in my life a year, I would be okay. No, you wouldn't. Because if we squander and aren't good managers of what we have, God will not give us more to squander. That's this parable. Each servant was given talents based on ability. That's what it says. Depending on each one's ability. Because God knows what we can handle. Amen? You know, I believe it was in the movie um, Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. But there's a line in that movie that he was told by his grandpa. I don't even know which one it was, but it was one of them. But he says, with great power comes great responsibility. And the same holds true that when the servant, that's us, is giving things from the master, that's him. It's up to us to either be faithful with it or not to be faithful with it. And God knows what we can handle. Let me give you number two. The talents, verse 19. Look, look at verse 19. After a long time, the master of those came to settle accounts. Those talents were given as a loan. Not a gift to be used, however each one saw fit. I want you to hear this today. Christ keeps no servants to be idle. Can I just say that again? Christ does not want us as his servants to be idle. We are not to be idle with that which Christ entrusts us with. We have received everything from him, and we have nothing to call our own but sin. I want, I want to say that again. We have nothing. This is pretty profound here. We have nothing, 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 zero, zilch. In the Greek, zero means zero. You have nothing to call your own in this life but your sin. And everything that you and I have is based and because of the grace of the Father. Can you say amen, church? And, and, and Jesus, just like this master, is going to come back and he's going to settle our accounts. That's what happened in this parable. The master comes back and he settles with the man who he gave five. He settles with the man who he gave two. He settles accounts with the man who he gave one. Though it may seem a long time, he will certainly come. And he stays away long. You know why he stayed away this long? It's because he's trying to give time for his ministers to labor well. And you're sitting in that scene and you're saying, well, I hope you pastor labor well. No, guess, guess what? You are his ministers too. And I was told not to do this in Bible college. Keep your finger from pointing, but I'm going to point this morning. You and you and you and you and you and you and you. He said, well, I'm going to duck and I hope you're not pointing at me. But you and you and you, we are all his ministers. We are all his servants. And he is our master. And he's given you and I time to make a decision if we will labor for the service well because all the gifts he's given us, we are should not and not, and, 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 and God forbid if we become a lazy and wicked servant. Luke 19, 13, a similar parable. He calls ten servants together and delivered them ten pounds, and he said, occupy till I come. In other words, we're not just supposed to occupy and sit on the couch and play Tetris. We're not just supposed to sit on the couch and occupy in the church and, 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 and play Facebook games. But that word means, that word occupy says that you know that one hour the master is coming and we should be and keep in readiness. Amen? We should occupy. We should minister. We should labor. Watch this. We should watch and pray. You know, when, when Jesus said, I'm going to leave and, and, and I'm going to send you another comforter, he told them to go to the upper room and he told them to what? To wait. 
and to occupy. And you know what they did? They just didn't eat bonbons and wait. But they sat there and they sang the psalms and they talked the psalms and they prayed. And they said, come, Lord Jesus, come. Part of occupying is to be busy for the Lord. Amen? You were given your talents on loan. Point number three. Point number three this morning. That when He gives us our talents on loan, it is our job to use it or lose it. That's our job. Whatever your talent is. I know somebody that was very gifted for the Lord. Musically. Went to the Conservatory of Music on scholarship and played piano. I could walk up on the platform, and this is years ago, it's not anybody here, so some of y'all are like, Who, who's he talking about? Well, some of y'all need to mind your own business and just listen to this story and stop being a busybody and a gossip and a worry word and just listen to the practicality of what I'm about to tell you. There's something about me. I'm, a, I'm, I'm bold today, Leah. You know what I think it is? It's the shoes. Some of y'all are like, preacher, we pay you too much. You got a pair of Air Jordans. Well, let me tell you, these Air Jordans are 10 years old, and I got them on sale. So humbug you. I wear size 12 if anybody wants to bless the pastor with another pair of Jordans. I'll preach better. But this person was gifted. I could walk on the platform and just start singing any song, and this person could just start playing it. And we would have some beautiful times and wonderful times of worship. But this person left the Lord. And they left the friendly confines of the local church. person could sing like a songbird. And went away like the prodigal. And wasted it all on riotous living. And stopped using their talent for the Lord. And they came back to the church. And one Sunday wanted to start singing. And it was many years. And because they hadn't use their talent and their beautiful voice for the Lord. They were but a shell of the person that they were once were. If you don't use your talent for Jesus, He's going to take it away. And in this story, the servants, they manage the master's money. And it comes time for the receipts to be given. And for these first two guys, this key word, well done, thy good and faithful servant, faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. God is so faithful to us. Amen. He was faithful to save the Israelites from the Egyptians. He opened Sarah's womb in her old age. He delivered David in battle all over Scripture, even until the point where we saw that God is so faithful to us that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and my sins. But the Bible also says, even though God is faithful, He says we are called to be faithful as well. And we have an account here. Two of the three were very faithful. We can say good things about the work of the first two servants. They did their work promptly. They did their work with perseverance. They they were successful. They were ready to give an account. But this third person, this third group, which... He's talking about they didn't do so well. We can say of the work of the third servant, he didn't think, he didn't work, he didn't try, and he made excuses. You know what the master was looking for? Faithfulness when he returned. And when he returned, because they were faithful to the master, these guys didn't, they were servants, they didn't deserve any extra. But because they were faithful to the master, they received five, received five. The guy with the two talents received two more. Charles Spurgeon said this, It's not well done, thy good and brilliant servant. For perhaps the man never shone at all in his eyes a sense of glitter or glare. It's not well done, thou great and distinguished servant, for it is... 
possible that he was never known beyond his village. It's better to be faithful in the infant school than to be unfaithful in the noble class. That's all God is. You know what God is trying to get us to do? Get up out of bed in the morning. And to put up one foot in front of the other. Can, can I tell you, there are some Sunday mornings. Can, can I just confess this morning? We're not told how these guys traded their talents. We're not told about what they did and, and, and who they went to and who they bartered with. We're, we're not told any of that stuff. But all we're told is they're faithful. There are some Sunday mornings that I would just like to lay in bed. Amen? You say, preacher, my Sundays have my only day to sleep in. But what I find, there are some Sunday mornings that, I, that I'm sick and, and, and don't feel like being here and preaching or singing. I barely got a voice this morning. I coached our kids too hard yesterday in ball. Not really. They did a good job. But what I find, listen to me, what I find, listen to me, it's not based how I feel. And it's not based upon how you feel. Because can I tell you, the Lord and His Spirit this morning just ushered Himself in this room and I got like a burst of energy. And I can nap later. But when we're faithful, when we don't feel like it, Re oh, oh, by the way, remember Jesus when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he said, Father, Father, Abba, Abba, not, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to die. I know what's, what's going to happen. But he said, not based on how I feel, not my will. Oh, but yours be done. Aren't you so glad that the heart of Jesus was not his will, but the Father's will? And you know what? The Father's will said, listen to me, you just got to keep on going. You don't feel like it. You just got to keep putting one foot or the other. Say sometimes you say you fall and you sin and, and you have a bad thought or whatever. You know what? You can fall down, but just get up. Just make sure you fall forward because when you fall forward, you're that much closer to the end game. And to this last guy, listen to me. He said, you're going to use it or lose it. <clears throat> The first guy he said, enter into the joy of the Lord. This is the echo of heaven, that there is a place of joy when we serve the Lord faithfully. But look at these strong words. Look at these strong words. You wicked and lazy servant. Verse 26. Some translation says, you evil, lazy servant. Those are some strong words. You know what that means? It means those who don't work for the Lord, those who don't pray, those who don't evangelize, because God is looking for faithful servants, not wicked and lazy servants. Listen to me, it's not like Monopoly. It's not like you pass go, collect your $200, and then you get that get out of jail free card. Listen, salvation isn't your get out of hell free card. Because if salvation, listen to this preacher, was your get out of free, uh, hell free card, then why, when you accept Jesus Christ and when you're baptized, he might as well just zap you and take you on to glory. But as long as you're breathing, you are called to praise the Lord. And you are called to serve the Lord. You got a purpose. You got a calling. Let me say it this way in context of the message. As long as you're breathing, I don't care how young you are, you youngins in here, and I don't care how old you are, you got a purpose. And you know, your first purpose, as long as you're breathing, you ought to be praising. As long as you're breathing, you ought to be praising. You should use or lose it. And, and look at this use it or lose it. The wicked and lazy servant, he took the one talent away from him. And he gave it to the guy that had ten. And you know what we'd say in our culture? Well, that's just not fair. Why is he? He's already got ten. Oh, he must, must love. Listen, listen. Our culture today is a lazy, wicked culture that plays the blame game. That it's everybody else's fault. 
We get in messes, and the reason we're in messes is because we are the ones that made those decisions, not somebody else. Amen? You say, well, preacher, I was driving on the highway, and I got a ticket, and I didn't deserve the ticket. Well, you were going in an 80 and a 35, and we blamed the police officers. How dumb. Right? God rewards faithfulness. And he punishes those who take advantage of his grace. Let me give you the last one, verse 30. And throw this good for nothing servant into the outer darkness. Because he was lazy and because he was wicked, listen to me, even though he was a servant, he demonstrated that he wasn't a true servant of his master. Just as there's a sense of heaven for these, for servants that are faithful, there's also a strong sense of hell as the destiny of the wicked servant. And it got quiet in here. Listen to me this morning. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There is a heaven. But the re- See, we can celebrate and rejoice by, ooh, ooh, praise God, there's a heaven, yes. Yes, but here's the, here's the other side of the coin. Unfortunately, there is a hell. That if we are wicked and lazy, if we don't serve faithfully well, we find out what happened to the wicked servant. <clears throat> it's, about if, it, it's about being ready for Jesus' return. And you say, well, I'm ready. What does your life show that you're steady, steadily about the business of the Lord as you're ready for his return? In light of this parable this morning, we have to ask ourselves, what have you done with your knowledge? What have you done with your time? What have you done with our money? What have we done with it? What have we done with our abilities? You know, the sins of commission, what we don't do may ultimately be more dangerous than the sins of commission, which is the sins of what we do do. When I was a kid, and I'm going to close with this, <clears throat> there's a song that I heard many, many, many years ago when I was a kid. When I was just like some of these young kids' age that are sitting here, River, when I was River's age, I, I heard this song. I pray, River, that when you get my age, And when I'm no longer on this earth, River, that you remember some of the songs that we sang. That maybe you just remember a word, just one thing that this preacher said. You're not going to remember any of my messages, but just remember that I cared and that I was faithful. And there's a song that said, it's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And then verse 2, it's not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Can we examine our life today and say, God, it's me? You want a good church? Can I tell you the secret to a good church? It's not a flashy preacher with yellow shoes on this morning. Or an untucked shirt. You know the secret to a good church? It's you. If you want an exhilarating worship experience, you ready your heart during the week. It's not our job to prime your pump and pump you up. You should come in here pumped. Fill yourself up during the week and be ready to give the Lord all. 
You want a good message? You say, Lord, why don't you pray for whoever? Listen to me, whether it's me or whoever gets up here. Any time that this sacred book is open behind this sacred desk, we should get something out of it. You know, in some of the larger churches, one of our largest church of gods, they, they only have about eight to 9,000 on a weekend. And I sat with the pastor one time, and he told me, he said, we get calls in our office during the week. Ask who, who, who's going to actually preach this week. I say, is Pastor Marty preaching this week? And sometimes if Pastor Marty's not preaching this, this particular week, people won't show up because they want to hear Pastor Marty. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter if Pastor, Pastor Marty doesn't preach this weekend at crossings and Pastor Terry Fikes preaches. We should still get something out of the Word. Let me give you another one. I'm going to mess some of y'all up. If Pastor Marty's not available, if Pastor Terry Fikes is not available, then when Pastor Deidre, Sister Deidre Smith preaches. Oh, by the way, we're a church that, that affirms ladies in the pulpit. Is that okay? Then, 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 oh, well, I just can't show up today because they're going to have a, a woman in the pulpit. Anytime this book is open, anytime a piece of scripture is read, even if it's the sorriest homiletical person in the pulpit, anytime the scripture's read, we the, the Spirit of God should speak to us. I'm gonna say it again. I was trying to close. Y'all aren't making it easy for me to close. Anytime we open up the Word of God and the Scriptures read, we should hear from God. Okay, I'm not convinced y'all want to leave yet. Anytime the Word of God is open, we should hear from the Lord. On your feet this morning. You see how that works? You shout me down, you get out of here quicker. Or you keep me preaching more. It's your choice. We have to, listen to me though, we have to be prepared. We have to be prepared for Jesus' return in our hearts. But listen, part of our preparation is working for the Lord.